noon, good afternoon, happy Thursday. Welcome to Virtual Morning Report with your CP Solvers family. I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. It's so, so great to see you all. We are, um, we are in for the regular today. And what the regular means is, um, is that we need three of you, one case presenter to nerd out a case and two people to join us um, to reflect on the case. So if you have a case to present, please, please, please volunteer um, to uh, present the case. We'd love to learn with you. And um, if you would like to practice your reasoning skills with a friendly crowd, um, please, please, please volunteer to discuss. It's always a delight and we cannot do it without you. So we will stall until we do so. Um, in the meantime, I actually want to uh, um, I want to plug again something that's really uh, really really important to us, which is that um, I, I, as we've talked about before, um, the CP Solvers is a product of love that has been evolving naturally, just in response to what we think um, is fun for us to do and what is might be of value to the people who tune in. Um, but it's time now, two years in, for you to shape the work we do. Um, what do I mean by that? We really really want to know um, what you enjoy how you consume the work that we put out there, how you contribute to it um, with the sole purpose of really tailoring our um, approach to um, what you enjoy the most. So I just pasted, um, oh, <laughs> I need two hands to do this. I just pasted the feedback form in the chat. Oh, one second. There you go. Please, please, please give us feedback. I did this. Everyone does this. I have my opinions. What I enjoy the most, it's VMR. Um, and I hope you have uh, strong opinions too. Make them heard. And uh, you, hopefully the CP solvers will take the mold of what you all enjoy the most. So again, oh, I saw Emery. Thank you for doing that too. Look at that. Double request. Means you have to fill it out twice. I'm just kidding. Please don't do that. Just fill it out once. Um, so yes, another call to a case presenter and two volunteer discussants. I will... Um, if you're ready, Charmaine, we'll pass the mic to you. If not, I will ramble. Okay, we got a thumbs up. All right, my friend, take it away. Hi everyone, sorry, one more second. Hi all, um, good to join you. Um, thank you for joining us for another uh, VMR session on Thursday. Um, and I was gonna first reflect on polyneuropathy or bradycardia, all these things this year, this week that has come up, but I'm actually going to tell you a story of what happened a couple of days ago. A couple of days ago, I mean, actually it was last week on service. Um, so <laughs> when I had this um, really, really new attending moment of completely internally freaking out. So here's the story. Um, I was just like having a really, really busy day and I was really tired and felt really stressed and just, you know, all the feelings that um, I used, I'm used to getting um, as a med student, resident, and now as a new attending. And then I get this consult and it's a topic that I hadn't thought about for a while, I hadn't seen for a while, and that for which we don't have a subspecialty here. And I just like had this moment of like internal panic about like, am I supposed to be the one figuring this out? Like, I don't know. And internally, I was just like freaking out for a good like minute or so. And Something about having a lot of imposter syndrome that you deal with uh, is that it's always like uh, ready to jump in and be very unhelpful to you. So it's like kind of like sitting at the sideline saying, put me in coach. I have a lot of things to contribute that will make you feel worse about yourself. So I like immediately started being my imposter syndrome being like, this is it, you know, this is the time that they will find out that they really hired an incompetent physician. But, but the good thing about gaining some experience in medicine is, is that at this point, you have enough experience to say to yourself that you're like, no, 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 like, 
I've been through this before. I know I can handle this. So I like calm myself down. I have an Evernote on it. I like look it up, start writing like a pre-template my note. And it's in a section of the campus that I've actually never been to. So, and I was like, okay, I will, um, I have this idea that I'm just gonna, I saw who's um, also like usually one of my colleagues is here. I'm gonna go run this case by them afterward just to make sure I'm not missing anything. Worst comes to worst, I'll call Robbie or Reza. And uh, I walk into my colleague's office and I like to ask like, where is this uh, facility located in our campus that I've never been to? So as I walk in and I ask her and she also had gotten the, uh, the console uh, alert and so she was like looking into this patient's chart she tells me how to get there and she's like yeah I was just like looking at this consult and I wouldn't know what to do with it I'm so glad it went to you because I wouldn't know where to start I would probably just copy paste up to date uh, and then I immediately started laughing and I told her about how like 30 minutes ago I was like starting to freak out um, and it was actually ends up being great. I learned a lot. I thought really hard. We came up with a good plan for the patient. And it's like one of the best consults I've received so far. Um, but that being said, like those feelings are so real, even though that I know better. I know it's all about the growth mindset. I know it's all about um, the learning. Um, you still, when you're tired, when you're exhausted, this work is hard. And I, it never surprises me how much harder we can make it for ourselves. And while like medical knowledge and everything is clean and we care so much about, I often wonder about the people that I've learned the most from are people who are generous with their vulnerabilities, with their struggles, with their knowledge deficiencies. And that just won't show up on, as in medicine as fully humans who happen to be doctors. So this is just my plug to be fully yourself and you, you, and you don't know who you will help. Um, probably me. So thank you for listening. And I'm really excited to discuss this case. That's so profound. You know, you know I think, um, I think for someone, this is a topic that's near and dear to your heart for many reasons. And I think you're making them abundantly clear. And I know there's more nuanced reflections about this from a, uh, as a topic to study and to understand scientifically and to understand its prevalence incidents, you know, and I, but then there's the humanity of it, you know, and I think you're bringing out the humanity in it um, like no other. Um, and while we wait for a, um, a case presenter, it looks like we have two, um, two discussants. I'm curious if you, if, um, if you if you feel like the frequency at which it um, takes over uh, in moments is reduced, and if so, like how 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 does it how does one come to experience it less and less? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this, and I think it's there, but you just get better at managing it and like Kimberly Manning had a great tweet about this a while ago is that like it's not that she doesn't experience imbatha syndrome anymore is that like she has a village that helps her she um she knows what she's doing is valuable and that like when she looks in the mirror like she tells all her so she got this and that she has a village to tell her she got this and she has this all of these experiences to tell her that so i think it does change and unfortunately a lot of it comes from just experiencing and having have handled i mean in medicine like sick patients or like having some successes to put under your your belt um but the other thing is also just having people who are sh share those things with you. I always like say if I knew what imposter syndrome was as a medical student, I would have been so much better off versus like learning about it later on. Um, and so it does get better. It does take a village and it's work and it's still a good amount of cognitive work that I just know to manage better. It's just like a chronic medical issue, right? You're just like learn to manage it better, but it never like goes away. Um, 
I was listening to Emily Silverman's, uh, our friend Dr. Inez podcast yesterday. She was talking to the author of the book Letters to a Female Physician. And there's this part of it that really resonated with me. Um, they, she said like she was meeting up with a colleague of hers from medical training who is a black man. And they were talking about the racism and sexism they experienced in medical training a while back. And she makes a comment of like, I don't know how I, uh, how I ever was so infatuated with a system that has so little regard for me. And her black colleague turns uh, and says like, no, you're wrong. Like they loved you and they loved me too. And we made everybody's lives better. We made them happier and we were stars. Uh, and we know it wouldn't take for much for our stars to fall. And that's why we needed to be perfect. And that's, um, and then she reflects some more about how she bought in this Murray mentality of doing more and working more. And I think that is kind of part of the issue that they so beautifully said is that it's just kind of the fear of uh, not being enough in other people's eyes um, that also like is a, a driver of it. But it's getting better and it will keep getting better. I think with the more diversity, with more people showing up at themselves, it only is going to get better. It's very powerful and I think your words stand alone, my friend. Um, I think it's hard not to think that this is the ultimate iatrogenesis. You know, we talk about how we iatrogenically harm our patients all the time. And I think we harm our patients because of how much we harm ourselves. And for me, the, the way that I've combated uh, imposter syndrome more recently is to realize that um, it's actually this like whole notion of perfection is an illusion. I've yet to meet anybody who I've come across who I would be like, oh my God, if I get to them, I will be immune to this phenomenon. Like there's this whole person of I am not enough compared to what? And when you think about the what, you realize actually that person doesn't exist. There is no, everyone's an imposter, really. Every single one of us is an imposter. So we might as well shed that cloak and realize that all of us are just people who are trying their best. Um, yeah, so and totally. Absolutely. That's so beautifully said. It's kind of like having being in medicine and having certainty, right? Like well, so much of what we do is uncertain. And so, yeah, there's no such thing as perfection. 100%. Welcome all to the club of all the imposters. Together, we are all, we are all the same. It looks like we have a crew. Um, we'll start off just in order of people who volunteered. So Noah, please welcome back. It's so great to see you here. I'm sure you've been around. I've been away here and there. We might have missed each other. Please reintroduce yourself, and then we'll go to our other uh, um, case, uh, case discussant, Martin, and then to our presenter, Anne Marie. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, if there is some bubbling in the background, sorry, my rice cooker is going. So, so if, if I say anything wrong, it's because the rice cooker masked my correct words today. Um, I'm uh, I'm Noah. I'm a, a fourth year medical student at NYU. Um, who's heading to internal medicine at BI in Boston um, and excitedly moving and, and doing all of that stuff. So I've been out of, out of clinical context for a little bit and it's nice to, nice to be here and, and reinforce these skills. A real pleasure to have you back, my friend. Welcome. Martin, good morning. Good evening here, uh, but hello. Um, so I'm Martin, um, I'm from Belgium. And I'm in my last year of medicine, uh, going through selections for internal medicine. So hopefully in a few months, I can uh, start my residency. Incredible. Are you planning on starting a residency in Belgium or how does that, how does that work? Uh, yes, I'm, yeah, it's, it's like six years with us. I don't know how it's in, in other countries. And every year we switch from hospital. Um, the most hospitals are in Belgium, but uh, yeah, we can choose to do one or two years abroad. Uh, mostly it's in, in the last years, but but most of the time in Belgium and you can exchange for, for a year or two. Amazing. That sounds so cool. Awesome. Thank you for joining us. La last but not least, the cactus that gives life. Hello. Please tell them what I mean. Hello. <laughs> Drink container that I have. It currently has coffee in it. Um, so I said it's giving me life. Uh, it's just it's just cool. life. Um, it makes my drinking container so boring. <laughs> uh, also, 
one too. Oh, thank you. All right, you ready to rock and roll? I think yeah, I, I, I just... Oh, I'm gonna let y'all choose your adventure. Um, would y'all rather do a case of diarrhea or a case of uh, fever and hydronephrosis that was my SJM poster from yesterday? Fermin, no? Okay, diarrhea. Okay, let's do it. All right, since I picked Charmin, you go first. Um, so a six five year old male presents with a 2.5 month history of diarrhea. Um, the diarrhea occurs during the day as well as throughout the night with about 10 to 12 bowel movements a day um, that are watery um, bowel movements without blood. Um, it did feel that lactose made it worse, um, but did not resolve with elimination, um, did not note any other triggers, has had 40 pound weight loss during this time, and also fatigue, generalized weakness, and intermittent nausea and vomiting, um, but denies abdominal pain. No fevers, chills, or joint symptoms. And I will leave it there. Uh, thank you so much, Anne-Marie. I feel like your cases, I always walk away learning so much from you. So I'm so glad to see you present another case. Anila, do you want to tag this thing together, friend? Yeah, let's let's do it. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so um, so I'll start off by trying to characterize the the diarrhea. Um, two months or two and a half months here um, really puts us more at a chronic diarrhea. Um, generally, anything longer than like two to three weeks would be considered on the you know moving towards that chronic phase. Um, and there are certain certain aspects of this history that make me honestly pretty concerned. Um, when I'm thinking about chronic diarrhea, I'm thinking about whether there's, you know, a, an osmotic, a secretory, or even inflammatory cause going on. Um, and some of the factors here, specifically the fact that it's occurring throughout the night um, and is not necessarily like a postprandial or or related to um, related to digestion specifically. Is concerning for maybe it may be a secretory diarrhea, um, but there are there are other factors that we have to concern. We want to look at like the actual stool and, and look at the maybe the anion gap as well um, to actually confirm whether it's secretory or osmotic. Um, the watery nature without blood here also is pointing maybe a little bit less away from an inflammatory cause, but I'm pretty sure that uh, you know the lack of blood isn't that much of a negative predictive uh, factor in inflammatory diarrhea. So. And especially because a lot of secretory causes may result from inflammatory damage to the gut lumen. So we, we'd still consider a lot of those causes. Um, when I'm looking at sort of the systemic symptoms, I'm also pretty concerned that there might be some sort of malabsorptive or general um, you know, process that's caught, like essentially coming from the gut leading to these systemic symptoms. 40 pounds of weight loss is a lot. And things that cause a lot of weight loss for me are concerning for like a cachexia, cachexia syndrome, such as cancer, whether that's due to chronic inflammation or some sort of other cause, or just really severe malabsorption. Um, and I think all of those could fit that picture at this point, especially we have a 65 year old male who could fit really any of those um, demographics. Um, the the fatigue and generalized weakness also sort of fit within that picture for me. And, and I'm struggling to necessarily put them in a specific box or, or narrow in at that point. Um, things I'd probably want to know really are whether they, whether this patient has a, a good cancer screening history in this case, someone who's 65 is at risk for um, a lot of different cancers. And, and I'd want to know their autoimmune history, want to know if there's a family history, um, and then really what their, their prior GI history would be like, um, really to set a baseline for what this 10 to 12 bowel movements is a lot. And this sounds very different from their baseline, but I'd want to still know if they've had this in the past um, and whether we can characterize any sort of GI problems that would lead us to maybe some sort of pathophys um, here. And then the final thing is this intermittent nausea and vomiting doesn't necessarily lead me towards any 
any specific um, etiology or, or area within the GI tract, um, which is where I'm trying to localize it now, um, because obstructions can cause intermittent nausea and vomiting, but also it can also be a symptom of a lot of other conditions and is fairly nonspecific. Um, if it were prandial, that would give me a little bit more of a, a picture of maybe you know, maybe there's something um, hepatic or biliary going on, or maybe there's something even obstructive in the proximal GI tract. But given that we don't have that characterization right now, and we have uh, diarrhea that's not necessarily prandial, um, I'm not necessarily honing in on, on that intermittent nausea and vomiting yet as a problem. Um, the one final thing that I think is interesting here with nausea and vomiting, though, as, as I'm talking about cancer and uh, and diarrhea is that the pancreas is certainly something I'd be considering and, and very worried about in a patient like this. Um, loss of pancreatic function can cause chronic diarrhea, especially, you know, malabsorptive diarrhea, um, but also can cause intermittent nausea and vomiting from obstruction of the biliary tract or whether that's from a mass or, or chronic pancreatitis um, as well. Um, and can certainly present in this fashion. So when I'm thinking about things that would kill a patient in the subacute to chronic process and, and really sort of red flag symptoms that this patient has, that's something that immediately jumps to mind. Um, so yeah, I'd want to I'd want to characterize those specific things a little bit more um, and really be trying to tease out whether this is a secretory process, whether there's some malabsorption going on, or whether there's some inflammatory or obstructive process going on in the background that's that's leading to this. Noah, you're such a boss. That was fantastic. I have nothing to add. Um, Anne Marie, take it away. Um, so moving on, had been hospitalized six weeks ago um, with these symptoms um, and found to have hypokalemia and volume depletion. During the hospitalization, had received an EGD with a biopsy, which showed the total erosion with some reactive and regenerative changes, no increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, um, and then no evidence of alumina uh, perfia macrophages. Um, had also received a colonoscopy with biopsy, which was negative for microscopic colitis. Um, and then had received an extensive um, serum workup, including a normal TSH, um, pomegranin, a aspirin, BIP, celiac serologies, a GI pathogen panel, C. diff. Um, the fecal elastase was low, um, but was thought to be unreliable in the setting of diarrhea, um, had been started on pancreatic enzymes with mild improvement, um, but not resolution of symptoms. Um, was um, the ARB oh, um, was also stopped during the hospitalization um, with maybe for two weeks with minor improvement, um, but without full resolution. Um, was also treated for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, first with rifoxin and then with amoxicillin, and then was transitioned to doxycycline with worsening of symptoms. I also received a CT um, prior, six weeks ago, that showed a 1.2 centimeter vague area um, of hypo enhancement um, in the pancreatic neck. Um, and then a follow-up MRI um, confirmed the 1.3 centimeter pancreatic cyst. Um, and then um, also no aquatic food exposures or intake or anything like that. Oy, oy, oy. This case is getting more loose and loose. Martin, where are you at? Um, I think I'm going to need some help because um, I'm, not really, I'm not really sure what, what to make uh, of all of this. Uh, you know, it seems like, like this, the, the, the evaluation here is like negative, 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 then something. So what, what do you make of all the negative stuff? Um, 
Yeah, the colonoscopy is negative. So um, yeah, there, there are a lot of things that are excluded at this moment. I'm not thinking about uh, some malignancy in, in, the, in the bowel at this point or, or um, no, no um, inflammatory process in the bowel. Um, I don't know what the elastasis is. Uh, I don't know if I just don't know the translation or <laughs> don't know what it is. Um, I think it it's worse with the antibiotics, so so it it um, it's less likely to be something uh, infectious. So uh, not infectious, not inflammatory bowel, no malignancy in the bowel. So I I think we're getting away from the bowel, and we see that there's something going on in the in the in the pancreas. Um, but I'm not not sure what to make about uh, the cysts uh, uh, immediately. Um, yeah, I don't know the characteristics of of the of the, of the imaging. Um, I don't know if it's possible to get a biopsy at this point, um, or we should do other things first. I think that's brilliant, my friend. I think um, if we take a ten thousand foot view of two things, one, your, your discussion, and then the case itself. I think the hardest thing about where you're at is, is um, to acknowledge that this case has inherent uncertainty to it. And this is maybe the case, the, the clinical reasoning co equivalent of imposter syndrome. You cannot look at this and pretend like you know what's going on, you can't. And if you did, you'd be wrong. And I think the ability to say that out loud and to recognize that authentically is actually the hardest thing to do in this case. And so you'll see that when I reflect with you, I will offer no clear guidance as to what, the, what is going on in this case, but rather just reflect on how we actually make progress. So this certainty here is understanding chronic diarrhea better, not knowing what this patient has. And the best way to understand chronic diarrhea is to recognize that the, the way we test for it incorporates three layers. The fluid within the lumen, the lumen itself, and then stuff outside the lumen. And somebody who has chronic diarrhea, we study the fluid itself for the osm gap to see if there is an osm issue. We study the fluid itself for white blood cells to see if there's inflammatory reaction in the fluid, or we study it for calprotectin, which is a marker of inflammation. So we look at the fluid itself. We're like, what clues does the fluid give me? Is it osmotic or not? Is it inflammatory or not? We also look at the fluid for signs of deficiencies. What could be deficient in the fluid? Pancreatic proteins, which we expect to be there. And that's the fecal elastase. We expect that elastase to come from the pancreas. And if that's deficient, we're like, oh, the pancreas is on the hook. So we study the fluid itself. Then we study the lumen. How do we study the lumen? We take a camera in the form of a colonoscopy and we look. And then how do we study stuff on the outside that could either impinge or have a perineoplastic effect? We get a CT scan. So you're telling me that there's a case of diarrhea that involves all three of those measures that has not yielded a, a, a certain answer? Well, you know, this is going to be hard and it's going to be hard to make progress. And so the question is, what do we do with the fact that we no clear answer has emerged from the analysis of the fluid, the lumen, and the external space? The truth is there's some clues in either category. A low fecal elastase is a clue that there might be pancreatic insufficiency, but that test is very noisy. The colonoscopy being normal doesn't tell you anything about the uh, GI tract from stomach to small bowel and maybe open to limitations of a colonoscopy because there might be microscopic disease that the colonoscopy missed, like microscopic colitis, which is a patchy disease. What does the external imaging do? The external imaging tells us, hey, there's something going on in the pancreas. Now, what could be going on in the pancreas? The most common thing going on in the pancreas is a benign cystic lesion that represents an intrapapillary mucinous neoplasm, basically noise. But there are three things that are raised concern in the pancreas, and that's pancreatic adenocarcinoma, which usually does not result in a prominent diarrheal syndrome. There's pancreatic lymphoma, which is, not, um, which is rare, and there's neuroendocrine tumors. Now, the neuroendocrine tumors are a long list of uh, tumors that have effects on glucose metabolism, like an insulinoma or a glucagonoma, or have effects on um, the whole body through carcinoid syndrome, or have effects on the GI tract in diarrhea through a glucagonoma, or through a VIPoma, or much, much more rarely 
a somatostatin oma. But there are fancy ways of add anything and add an oma to it, and that's a neuroendocrine tumor. What's the key finding in this case? The key finding is the patient's got lost 40 pounds of weight and we can't find the cause. How can you lose 40 pounds and hide it? That accelerates the, the tempo of the workup. And I think what you have to do is you can start to make progress on each of those things. Let's study the stool for the osm gap. Let's study the stool for laxatives that are very, very common. Let's recognize the limitations of our luminal evaluation with maybe an endoscopy and, and a, a small bowel follow through. And let's chase this pancreatic um, process with potentially labs to study neuroendocrine tumor and or sampling. And all of those things I think um, are threads that we should follow and either of them may take us to an answer. We'll see. All right, Anne-Marie, back to you. Okay, awesome. Past medical history was notable just for hypertension prior to this. And then um, what we talked about before, um, the medications included um, a combination amlodipine, um, omalsartan um, that had been dose reduced recently, as well as the pancreatic enzymes and the doxycycline. Um, family history was non-contributory. Um, social history was non-contributory, no alcohol, drug, tobacco use, um, no travel whatsoever out of the country um, or out of the region recently, no abnormal food intakes like unpasteurized milk or anything like that, no pets at home. Um, and then health-related behavior was up to date on all of that. Um, as far as vital signs, uh, um, um, temperature was 36.8 degrees Celsius. Um, heart rate was 103. Um, respiratory rate was 12. Um, blood pressure was originally 86 over 64, um, but did improve to 108 over 78 after um, given several liters of fluid and was saturating well on room air. Um, as far as exam, um, appeared comfortable, um, but cachectic. Um, his um, exam was basically like his HENT, um, heart, lung exam, um, abdominal exam were all normal. Um, he had normal bowel sounds. It was soft. There was no um, hepatosplenomegaly um, on his extremities. Um, he did not have rashes, no synovitis, joint involvement, um, anything like that. His neuro exam um, was completely normal as well. Um, so basically, besides like sarcopenia and cachexia, on um, a completely normal exam. Um, as far as labs, um, the sodium was 129. Um, the potassium was 3.1. The fluoride was 102. The bicarbonate was 18. The BUN was 16. The creatinine was 1.84 from a baseline of 0.8. The glucose was 111. The calcium was 8.8. .8. The albumin was 3.7. The total protein was 7.3. The bilirubin was 0.9. The AST was 46. The ALT was 130. And the alkaline phosphatase was 75. The lipase level was 42. Um, the um, white blood cell count was 4.5 with a completely normal differential. Um, the um, hemoglobin was 16.5 and the platelets were 123. Um, the magnesium level was 1.4 and then the CRP level 
um, was less than five. And then um, we'll give you um, a little bit more. Um, the sodium of the stool was 76. Um, the potassium was 13.2 and the fecal fat was 19 um, with a normal fecal fat being less than um, seven. And then um, that was from a 48 hour stool collection and throughout the collection was noted to basically have so much diarrhea that um, the lab ran out of containers um, and had to stop it early. Um, so over like, like liters and liters of stool each day. Wow, I can't imagine what this patient might be feeling right now. Um, that's a lot of diarrhea. Um, Noah, uh, why? Um, uh, and Mary gave us some more information of what does the background, the exam, and uh, these labs do for you. Um, wow, that, definitely a lot of information. And I, I feel I feel like it, it, it definitely adds, adds a lot of um, interesting context to, to what we were thinking prior. Um, sort of the, the context of his past history and, and, and social history and health related behaviors, um, to me really, I, I, I'm trying to sum it up by painting the picture of, we don't have any known risk factors for why this patient could be necessarily infected from, and, and specifically with pancreatic cysts, I'm thinking of like a high added cyst or, in, or some sort of um, parasitic infection. And I don't see any specific reasons why that patient would have one of the subacute to chronic infections um, that would cause this type of picture. Um, it doesn't rule out necessarily, but it's not necessarily jumping above some of the neuroendocrine um, causes of this, this presentation for me. Um, and I think the interesting thing, um, as I was thinking about um, the treatment that he's gotten um, so far, uh, thinking as even though neuroendocrine, because neuroendocrine tumors are, are so much weighing on my mind, um, I was thinking about how he's he's been given pancreatic enzyme repletion, which would hypothetically help with some some fat uh, digestion, but it wouldn't decrease the increased levels of enzymes that would be caused by these islet cell tumors. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily lead us away from any of that. And in fact, maybe even um, increases our suspicion. Um, and when I'm, when I'm looking at the the exam and, and, and vitals, nothing necessarily surprises me here. Um, we, I generally get a picture of someone who doesn't have any acute abdomen, doesn't have any concerning signs, but is clearly concerning for some sort of volume depletion, which is consistent with this clinical picture. Um, the heart rate and, and blood pressure are certain, the fact that, you know, I, I wonder whether the heart rate responded to, um, but the fact that it was volume responsive is pretty likely um, that he was, he was depleted from this significant diarrhea. Um, I was actually wondering whether he was going to have any vitamin deficiencies and we would see any like peripheral neuropathy on exam, um, but it sounds like two and a half months might not be enough to have any significant deficiencies that would lead to any, any neuro or skin findings. Um, but the fact that we don't means that he might, may, maybe doesn't have one of the vitamin B or, or um, other deficiencies necessarily. Um, in terms of his labs, um, I, I think again, it's consistent with a picture of a sort of secretory diarrhea process. I haven't calculated, I'll start actually with the stool because it's a little bit easier for me right now. Um, cause it's just a, a, a subtraction and I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I think it there's, I know it's 290 minus something. Um, but this, I, I if, if anyone has the, the calculation in the chat, um, like whether this is secretory or osmotic likely. Um, I, I think it's secretory, but I'm not sure. Um, uh, but uh, given that there's elevated fat, that's also concerning for like, for this um, malabsorptive process, especially with fat digestion. So further localizing, localizing us to maybe a neuroendocrine process. Um, or, or some other infiltrative process um, causing this pancreatic dysfunction. And, and the BMP also is consistent for me with that. Um, we have a, 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 a hyponatremia, a, a hypokalemia, um, and, 
and those two in particular, um, to me, actually, uh, I, my suspicion gets raised for one particular um, neuroendocrine tumor, the VIPoma, um, because of the increased ADH that could happen. Um, and then I think vasopressin also can, I don't remember exactly the mechanism, but I think it can lead to a hypokalemia as well. Um, and so that, that would be something that would be jumping within that subset, maybe a little bit more. Um, oh, thank you, Drew. Uh, it's osmotic. Okay. Um, good to know. That actually changes changes the, the thought process a little bit. Thanks for the calculation. Um, yeah, I, I would still be concerned for a lot of these, but I within that, that would raise my, my suspicion. I Nothing off the top of my head in terms of like infections or chronic inflammatory conditions um, jump out at this point. Um, and I don't really know how to reason through this increased ALT um, yet. Uh, it seems fairly isolated, and I don't necessarily know whether there's some sort of hepatocellular small process going on or whether um, this is a little bit more noise than signal. Um, so I guess all in all, that means I'm not exactly sure where to go from here. Um, but yeah. I am. Uh, unsurprisingly, I'm right there with you. In a lot. Like, incredible job of walking through such a complicated presentation and such a severe presentations. And I don't know what's going on either. Um, I think your reasoning was very sound. And I often like, if I had to take a step back and I'm like, okay, what is like the base rate of disease when it comes to like chronic diarrheas, right? And thinking about like in the atypical presentations of like common diseases are more common, right? So like thinking about dietary changes, IBS, IBD, it can just be an atypical presentation of an IBD. Um, that CRP would argue against that, uh, but um, something to also still in the inflammatory bucket to keep considering, although less likely. And with that awesome gap, it, um, yeah, absolutely. It's like osmotic chronic diarrhea. I totally agree with you that I have, I have never seen a, kind of a neuroendocrine oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, tumor, yeah, but my understanding of them that is that it has, they present with like kind of severe symptoms, yeah, but it's so right. similar to this patient. And with that weight loss, I think like malignancy, um, uh, uh, malignancy that is just kind of hiding with us within the GI tract because of the patchiness of it, um, we should uh, consider as well. And um, the other thing to think about when you think about osmotic, like, you know, laxative use, all that stuff that, again, like this patient is hospitalized, um, his uh, setting is controlled, uh, but that can cause it too. And when I think about osmotic, I think about more like um, diet and iron. So again, like, yes, uh, unless I'm missing something big, there's a discrepancy for me with this presentation and this being an osmotic uh, diarrhea. So uh, I will be, uh, be open to uh, this, as you mentioned, like the secretary causes and also more like the malignancy um, processes as well. But okay. with that ALT, as you mentioned, I think that's something okay. that I would note on and track, uh, given just the degree of diarrhea and the degree of this, um, his blood pressure being so low, was the liver just got a little stressed as a byproduct of the severe presentation? Or is it somehow linked to our a pathology, and I think just trending those labs will be really informative. Um, all in all, to say, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I'm looking forward to learning from Anne Marie. <laughs> awesome, great discussion. Um, so, sorry. So uh, further laboratory um, data showed a negative C. diff and a neg negative GI pathogen panel. A capital uh, lambda ratio was 1.42. Triptase was 5.6. Um, CMV, IgG, and IgM were negative. Somatostatin was 9. VIP was less than 50. Chromographin A was 527. Um, with a reference range being less than 93. The urine um, 5-HIAA was normal. HIV was negative and stool calprotectin was 84. Um, immunoglobulins were normal and uh, B3 level was also normal. A REAP EGD um, showed moderate acute and chronic duodenitis um, with surface erosion. 
a stomach biopsy um, with special um, looking um, for, you know, um, Whipple's disease and things like that was unremarkable. Gastric mucosa with no evidence of chronic active gastritis or intestinal metaplasia um, and no evidence of H. pylori. And then a repeat colonic random biopsy um, with no significant pathologic abnormality, including no um, lymphocytic or collagenous um, colitis. And then conga red staining was also negative. An alpha-1 antitrypsin level of the stool was um, less than five. Um, throughout admission, um, continued to have um, diarrhea. Oh, on the edge of our seat. Oh, sorry, one, one more thing. Um, they, they reviewed the MRI um, from the last hospitalization and felt like it was more consistent with a uh, branch plate um, IPM and did not feel like it was consistent with a neuroendocrine tumor. And so had decided not to pursue um, a biopsy at that time. Alrighty. Martin. This case uh, is stumping the GI team. But more importantly, this case at this point is presumably stumping Anne Marie because she hasn't had the answer yet. So um, we're in trouble. And all we can really do is try to think through this. So I'm curious, where where is your head at with, with all this information coming your way? Okay, to be honest, this case is really um, over yeah. my head. I think <laughs> I should revise on my uh, gastroenterology. Um, the thing that uh, most comes to mind is a, is a chromogranin, yes. um, which, which is way too high. Um, I don't know much about neuroendocrine tumors, but I know it's, it's one of the most important markers um, that makes me think about um, neuroendocrine tumor. Um, um, yeah, I think, <laughs> I think my knowledge uh, stops, stops there. <laughs> Um, I was al I was already thinking about something malignant, so I think this definitely um, takes us to the to the malignant um, stuff. You know, despite you saying you don't know, you've taken all this data and you've highlighted the thing you need to highlight, which is that elevated chromogram in A. I think that's the key finding. Um, let me share with you what I'm at. We only have a few minutes left, um, so I'll try to be brief. We started this case with understanding that this is chronic diarrhea. And then the question was, is it osmotic, secretory, or inflammatory? And I'm going to try to be as concise as possible. A low CRP reduces significantly the possibility of inflammatory diarrhea. And when the calprotectin is not impressively high, we can move chronic inflammatory diarrhea to the side. There are features here that are diagnostic of osmotic diarrhea. Now, what are those? There's actually two. The osmotic strongly suggestive of osmotic diarrhea. But in addition to that, secretory diarrhea alone does not result in weight loss. It's no, secretory diarrhea is like giving a patient Lasix and watching their urine output go up. If you continue to give that patient enough fluid, they will not have a drop in their kidney function. So secretory diarrhea, the equivalent of the channels of the GI tract not working well, do not result in marked dysfunction of the whole body. So the case for osmotic diarrhea is all, certainly the osm gap, but more importantly, it's the support that there's weight loss alongside with it. You will only see weight loss in inflammatory diarrhea and osmotic diarrhea, but there is pathognomonic finding of secretory diarrhea here. It's one, that the diarrhea occurs at night, and two, that it is continuous and independent of meal fluctuations in the hospital under the observation of the team. So our system has failed us. How do we have both an osmotic and secretory diarrhea? How do we connect a very compelling case with a neuroendocrine tumor with an elevated chromogamin A with both an osmotic and secretory diarrhea? Most neuroendocrine tumors are secretory alone. The one neuroendocrine tumor that does osmotic and secretory is a gastronoma. Why? The elevated gastrin causes marked drops in pH, which leave all your enzymes all acidic and dysfunctional. You get nauseous, you vomit, and you have an osmotic diarrhea and a secretory diarrhea. 
So I'd say here, the case for looking for a gastronoma is very, very, very strong. It doesn't get stronger than this case to look for it. Why? You have a middle-aged classic demographic. You have an osmotic and secretory diarrhea. You have upper tract and lower tract symptoms because the gastric pH causes everything to move. You have, you have that, you have an elevated chromogram and A, you have duodenitis, you have to look for it. Now, why do I say you have to look for it? The probability of a gastronoma, no matter what, until a pathologist sees it is always low because it's so rare, but you have to look for it here. And I think that's where the targeted assessment is going. And if you don't find it, you have to look harder. And if you still don't find it, you have to look harder. And then if you still don't find it at some point, you have to look differently, but you have to look really hard for it. So we'll see. Uh, but I think, I think the learning here is there are very few causes of osmotic and secretory diarrhea. If you enter this very, very rare world, the odds are the gastrin level will be high and you'll find a gastronoma, but medicine is too humbling to ever commit to that. But that's where my head is at. I'll pass the mic to you. We had a two morning fasting gastrin levels um, that were both completely normal. Um, did undergo a um, small, um, small a capsule endoscopy um, that showed mucosal changes throughout um, with granularity and distal fissures of the small bowel. Um, an autoimmune enteropathy panel was negative. Um, at this point, uh, presumed um, diagnosis was made, um, which was partially um, helped um, by the addendum of um, the pathologist about the first study. Um, so I don't know if y'all have any final thoughts. I am at the edge of my seat. I have, wow, what a case. Go ahead, tell us, please. Um, so the, um, the capsule endoscopy um, looked like an enteropathy um, as when the pathologist looked at the EGD again, also looked like an enteropathy. And since the autoimmune um, panel was negative, um, was diagnosed with um, omal asartan, um, I always struggle to say that, um, induced enteropathy. Um, so I thought this was a really interesting case. Um, because I think I actually did not realize um, when he first came in, since it was a combination um, pill, that he was still taking that. I thought it was just um, the amlodipine when we had talked about it. So there was some confusion and it had been held throughout admission um, and it continued, but I also learned that it can um, continue for um, sometimes weeks after it stopped as well. Um, and it can also be associated with um, SIBO um, as well in about 70% of cases. Um, and so that kind of diagnosis was um, consistent as well. Um, so had been stopped throughout admission um, and then also treated with steroids and symptoms completely resolved um, at follow-up and was doing much better. Absolutely incredible. Emery, did you say Olmosartan or Losartan? I'm sorry. I think it was misunderstood when I um, oh. first said it. So, yeah, sorry. That might have that might have made it um, the case more difficult. Um, I I didn't realize that uh, it was going oh, to be. Oh, okay. it really doesn't matter. I mean, I'm glad the the patient has a diagnosis and is getting better. And I oh, I just have one question for you to teach us. Did you learn about? Um, there's a lot to reflect on on Olmosartan for sure. Did you learn about how that might um, uh, align with the chromogrammin or was the chromogrammin a noisy test or how, how did that settle with you all? I think it's just a noisy test because um, a previous level um, had been normal and then the um, 5-HIAA was normal. So the thought was just it was a noisy test, especially with the um, improvement with steroids and um, stopping the Olmosartan. I'm mind blown. That's all. I have a lot of reflecting and thinking to do. It was such a fun journey. I'm curious if Charmin, Noah, Martin, do you any final reflections before we pass the mic on to Rafa to summarize this unbelievably interesting case? Uh, Noah and uh, Martin, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure uh, discussing with you. And Marie, again, you never fail to teach me. I also have a lot of reflecting and reading to do. And 
I should have known it's always the medication, it's always the things we do to patients. <laughs> but I, I'm joking, I think um, it actually, um, I was thinking it was low certain made the discussion even more rich. So thank you all so much. Rafa, do you want to uh, teach us? Sure. Um, so thank you, Anne-Marie, for the awesome case. And thank you, everyone who participated today with us. So first, Noah reminded us to think that it's actually uh, patients with chronic diarrhea because it's defined more than four weeks. So we have to look at the stool and the stool osmolar gap. And then we can divide the chronic diarrhea in two subtypes, inflammatory or non-inflammatory. When it comes to inflammatory diarrhea, we could think about IBG, malignancy, but also radiation. There are many clues that could lead, uh, could point us towards uh, inflammatory chronic diarrhea. We can see if the patient has blood, mucus, fever, chills, weight loss, or any other clues to specify um, to diagnose. For example, if you see a rash, we could think about a celiac disease. When it comes to non-inflammatory causes, we have to look at the osmolar gap, stool osmolar gap. If it's greater than 50, we have to think about osmotic causes, which could be divided into fat um, diarrhea, for example, a diarrhea, parasitic cause, liver disease, pancreatic deficiency that we can see with, with uh, in patients with chronic pancreatitis, uh, also CF, or uh, if we can see if there is any carb, like in a lactase deficiency, or ions, patients with uh, using laxative. When it comes to secretory causes, the stool osmolar gap is less than 50. We have to think about chronic infections like HIV, malignancy, like lipoma, inflammation, like uh, microscopic colitis, motility disorders, like autonomic neuropathy that you can see, for example, in diabetes. And if the workup is negative, we could think about IBS or functional diarrhea. And then we talked about of lipoma, which is an endocrine tumor, uh, the secretes vasoactive intestinal peptide. It's associated with minimum, and it's a secretory diarrhea and leads to watery diarrhea, hyperkalemia, and achloridia. And then we saw that this patient had elevated chromogranin A. We could think about carcinoid syndrome diarrhea, so we checked for the H, uh, 5-HIA, which was normal. Um, we, which was also seen in, in small group of IBS, Patients, but we thought that this in this case was just noise. And then finally, we discussed about gastrinoma, uh, rabbit otters, that it could actually lead to secretory and osmotic diarrhea. The accessory gastric acid can be neut neutralized, and there's decreased pH in the intestine, leading to the inhibition of pancreatic enzymes. And also, uh, there is inhibition of sodium and water reabsorption in the small intestine. So, thank you, everyone. I hope everyone had a good time, and I hope to see everyone tomorrow. Thank you all for joining us. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And thanks again, team. Bye. Bye, guys.